You're watching Go Live On Demand with Pastor Smokey Norfolk and Victory Cathedral Worship Center. Your hope, healing, and empowerment starts now. Sit down if you can. There's a video that I want you to watch. It, it says so much. It's short, but it says so much. Just watch this. Daddy. <sighs> Daddy. Amen. There's something about hearing those words, Daddy. I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I'm in a crowd and I'll hear somebody else's child holler, Daddy, and it's just innate. I'll turn around. Knowing my children are nowhere in the vicinity, that's the most precious, special, incredible feeling in the world, being able to hear my kids call me Daddy. It is amazing. And I know I'm not by myself. I've got some absolutely amazing daddies that are here with me will all of my fathers please stand and we want to celebrate you on this father's day come on tell them happy father's day celebrate them let all of our dads stand we are excited about your presence in this place we honor you we celebrate you we thank god for each and every one of you amen and I especially want to thank God for my own daddy. Stay standing. I'm going to pray with all the fathers in just one moment. But I want to take time to thank God for my own father, my daddy. He's not just my father. He's my daddy, my friend. And so I celebrate him. Can we celebrate the chief dad of the house? He's your shepherd's dad. I love you, daddy. Thank you so much for everything. I don't, I don't have words to tell you. Thank you for all that you've done. Come on, family, church. Come on, stretch your hands in their direction. Let's pray for them. God, in the name of Jesus, for every father that is gathered here and all those that are assembled under my voice, even around the globe, I ask for your divine favor upon them right now, that you will overtake them with your goodness. Give them grace that they might forge ahead and press forward in being the best template, design, and example of what it is to be a father. Thank you, Lord, that you are conforming and transforming them daily so that they can be men of God, the ultimate shepherds, the phenomenal men that you've called them to be, the coverings for their families. And I ask, God, that you would give them grace, peace, and wisdom. Give them spiritual discernment. Order their steps and lead them in the direction that you would have them to go as they lead their children and their children's children. I ask, God, that you would continue to rain down blessings in everything that they endeavor to do and let everyone connected to them be prosperous as a result of it in jesus name in jesus name let the redeemed of the lord say amen amen you may be seated in the presence of our awesome god come on they they asked me to do this so he's smiling so far <laughs> He's, he's the newest one on my executive staff, so he's the only one that doesn't know I don't like this part. That's why they put you up to do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Um, we're going to ask Victory one, one more time. Just please stand as we honor, amen, Reverend uh, Norfolk Sr., if you could come to the stage at this time. We just want to give a token of our love on behalf of Victory Cathedral. We want to say happy Father's Day to one of the greatest dads <laughs> we thank god for your spiritual leadership we just we thank we thank god for you for being such a great dad to our spiritual leader amen one more time let's give a hand for reverend norfolk senior happy father's day and last but not least to our spiritual leader 
what can we say about Pastor Smokey Norfolk? We just thank God for the example of, of a great leader, a father, a, a husband. One, one of the things I love about Pastor Norfolk is that everything is a teachable moment. I don't care where we are, airport, whatever, everything is a teachable moment, and you're always in the mode of spiritual fathering, co coaching, mentor, and that's, that just speaks volume to us that are following behind you, that are lifting you up in prayer, and we just thank God for the example of leadership that you exemplify day in and day out. We love you to life. This, this in no way uh, could uh, uh, measure up to what you deserve, but we just want to give you a token from, from our heart, from Victory Cathedral to our senior shepherd. Come on, let's give God praise. Happy Father's Day. Thank God. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. There's not enough I can say about how much I love you back, and I appreciate you for making this shepherding job so much easier. I have seen pastors. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the dynamics that Pastor Gatewood and I were talking about recently is you have pastors that are quitting the pulpit every single Sunday. I think the statistic is something like um, it's, a hundred, it, it's hundreds of people a Sunday, pastors that are walking away from the pulpit. Uh, and it's, an, it's not it's not something that is, you know, theoretical. It's literal. These are literally, it's happening around the country. Uh, and so I just want to let you know that I know how fortunate, how blessed I am to have the best people in the world to be a spiritual father and covering too. So would you do me a favor? It's more of you than it is of me. Would you celebrate yourselves for me? Because you make this enjoyable. I appreciate you. I love you and I thank you. Now, last but not least, before I move into the next phase of the service, I just ask that you keep my family in prayer this week. Just continue to lift us up. Uh, how many of you will do that? We'll pray for the first family this week. Amen. I appreciate you. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to a very familiar passage of Scripture that I know is going to be an extraordinary blessing to your life. It's going to be an extraordinary blessing to your life. Thank and praise God that you will be blessed by this word on today. It's familiar. You've read it over and over again. It's not something that's going to be foreign to you. I promise you, you probably don't even need your Bibles to know what I'm about to say. But turn with me to the 23rd number of Psalm. The 23rd number of Psalm. Everybody said, oh yeah, I know that one. That's the one I know. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. I'm going to read it from a different version today. So it may be a slight variation from what you have in your Bible. But nonetheless, it is the word of the Lord. The 23rd number of Psalm, verses 1 through 6. When you found it, would you just say amen? amen. If you know it, would you shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Oh, are we working with, with, like my grandma said, you cooking with grease now, boy. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters and he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the path, the right path for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me, even in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Now, don't nobody shout right here, but surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God, in the name of Jesus, it's a preachable moment, and I do not profess to have wisdom, strength, acumen, grace, or anointing to do it without you. I need you now, God, to speak through me that we might hear from heaven. Use me as an instrument or vessel in your hands to be glory, to bring glory to your name. I thank you now that somebody's going to leave here better than they came, that you're going to change our thinking and ultimately change our lives. Our goal and our hope is that you will change people's eternity. 
and they will truly live in the house of the Lord forever. We rejoice for what you've done, for what you're about to do. And we who are believers of the Most High God, don't wait, don't wait till we see it, but we already see it. We thank you for what you're about to do in Jesus' name. That every expectant heart give God a radical, radical praise. Come on, that ain't radical. I said give him a radical praise. Hallelujah. Slap somebody high five and just tell them, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. You may be seated in the presence of our awesome God. Over the last couple weeks, I've been talking about uh, short stories that carry big messages. Many of you, of course, have become familiar with them. According to your television time, you know them as commercials. However, we have pulled from them some dynamic truths that are relevant in the word of God, giving you scriptural precedent for some of the principles that are being exhibited in some of these short stories with big messages or commercials. And so for the, the last couple of weeks, it's been an exciting thing to testify about how God is able to speak to us through the smallest things. But it's, of course, predicated and completely exclusive to what he has given to us already in the word of God. Last week, I encouraged the body to continue to encourage yourself that despite what the enemy throws at you, despite whatever challenges and problems you come up against, you can talk to yourself and tell yourself it's going to be all right. Anybody still feel that way a week later? I still believe it's going to be all right. I want to take it a step further today. And there's another short story that I love. This is incredible. It brought such laughter and such joy. I know it's going to bless you. Watch this story. Here it is. You look good. Thank you. Hey! See the guy taking my little girl out, huh? Yep. Huh. You know what? Why don't you go ahead and take my new car? Thanks, Pops. Go ahead, baby. Watch this. <laughs> Boom! Favorite spot, favorite girl. You left me with the wrong daddy! I'm taking you home. Why? Car finder. Back so soon? Here you go, sir. Because a dad's gotta do what a dad's gotta do. Honey, what'd you guys do tonight? <laughs> Kevin Hart is a man after my own heart. <laughs> I remember when my daughter went to prom. I was excited, and uh, it, was a, it was an amazing day. Of course, you know, it's a, it's a maturation moment. It's one of those rare moments that you only get uh, once in a lifetime. And so I was excited about it, uh, and I had, uh, I, I had worked myself up to a place of peace and patience with the reality that my baby girl is growing up, She's not 13 anymore. She's now going to her senior prom. And then she walked out of the house. And the dress that she had on, help me, Holy Ghost. All peace went away. So I'm looking at her. Then I look at him. And he's grinning from ear to ear. All his raggedy teeth showing. So by this time, something on the inside of me had been arrested. And I wanted to say so bad, go back in the house. She can't go. But I knew that wasn't going to go over well. So like Kevin Hart, I volunteered for them to take my Mercedes Benz. What they didn't know is that MBUSA will tell me where my car is at all times. So they thought they were getting over, but I was excited. Gladly enjoy it that I knew where they were at all times. And I continually called MBUSA all night long. I need to know where my vehicle is. Of course, she had no idea that I was watching them even when I wasn't there. And then I also remember a time when I was growing up, or sorry, when my children were growing up, 
they were younger and they got to a place of independence. You remember that, that's, that, that one little age of independence. They, f- they finally start telling you, I do it. I got it. I can do this. Well, as they continued to grow, they wanted me to know that they were independent. And I wanted them to be independent. I want them to be men of God. I wanted them to be independent and have the ability to fend for themselves and take care of themselves. And so uh, I would allow them certain, certain privileges or certain opportunities to illustrate or illuminate their own independence. One of them was when we were at the dinner table and they wanted to get up and go to the restroom. And I would allow them to go to the restroom by themselves. However... They didn't know. I would let them get up, walk away from the table, get out of sight just far enough that they could not see me. But as soon as they got out of sight, and I remember, I'll I'll never forget, first lady looking at me like, I know you're not going to sit here and let them go to the bathroom by themselves. I said, I got this. I got this. I'm a daddy. Let me do my thing. They get up and get out of my sight. I would get up. And I would peep around the corners and watch them the whole way to the bathroom. And when they got done, I would hurry up and get back to my seat so they would think they were by themselves the whole time. Isn't it phenomenal to know that we have a heavenly father who allows us to feel like we're doing something. But the entire time, he never takes his eyes off of us. He's peeping around the corner to make sure we don't get in any trouble and that no trouble finds us. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to know that I've got a shepherd who loves his sheep well enough that he won't let me be out here by myself. That he'll watch over me even when I don't know that he's watching. He's always watching over me. Somebody just thank God for the shepherd on today. Come on, he's our real father. He is our heavenly father. He is our first father. Today I want to highlight some of the things that I pulled out of this scriptural text. It is familiar, but my prayer is that God will illuminate and give new life to something that has become so so contemporary and so familiar in Christian in Christendom. Today I want to highlight how our heavenly Father, who is a good shepherd, how he sees after, how he oversees, how he covers, how he provides and sustains for the sheep. And we, the people of God, are the sheep of his pasture. We, the believers of the Most High God, are the sheep of his pasture, and he is our shepherd. I have to begin by just pointing out the first thing that he highlights. The Lord is my shepherd, and because the Lord is my shepherd, I lack absolutely nothing. I don't have to want for anything because our heavenly father understands that in his role, in his capacity to father us, to shepherd us, to lead us, to cover us, that his main priority and responsibility is also to sustain us or to provide for us. We have a God of provision. It's the shepherd's responsibility to make sure that the sheep are tended to, but also specifically that they are fed or satisfied. Philippians 4.19 tells us what that looks like in our own lives. But by my God shall supply how many of our needs? Say it one more time. Tell your neighbor, quit stressing. God's going to give you all. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Now, usually we stop right there. But I want to make sure that I take it a step further for our understanding purposes today. Usually we go, uh, but the Lord my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. But we leave off the next part. But the next part is probably the most essential and important part that exists. He's going to supply all my needs according according to what he has in glory but by Christ Jesus say it with me by Christ tell your neighbor by Christ you might as well slap him and tell him we're gonna preach this together today I ain't gonna be the only one talking up in here by Christ Jesus you cannot leave that part off It is imperative that you understand it is not negotiable. It is not optional that yes, your needs will be supernaturally and divinely met, but they will be met by Christ Jesus. Here's the problem with sheep. 
When sheep feel like they can do things on their own and do not need the shepherd to aid them, they end up in a world of trouble. Come on, somebody. Do I have a real church with me today? The worst time you will ever experience in the life of a sheep is when sheep get hungry. Because when they get hungry, they get agitated and restless. They can't sleep. They stop eating. They start moving and milling about. Nothing more disturbing than hungry sheep. And I have figured this dynamic out even in the life of a pastor. That it is nothing more frustrating or disturbing when I got a church full of hungry people. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. When sheep get hungry, here's the problem. They get restless and they start to wander. So whenever you see sheep that go astray and start wandering off, it's because they have gotten hungry. And in the life of a believer, let me tell you what that looks like. When you get hungry, you start feeling dissatisfied and unfulfilled in every area of your life. And so it causes you to wander off and try to find some things to fill the voids and the vacancies that are not external, but they're internal and they're derived from your soul. Are y'all with me? See, here's the thing. You can't fill the void with just anything. Because you can eat and eat and eat and you still not feel. I know I'm, I, I can't be the only one that has this, this experience. But do you know anybody that just, you, you, they can never be satisfied with anything. They keep saying, Lord, I need a new job. They gives you a new job and guess what? It's not good enough. So they go from job to job to job to job. And they jump from relationship to relationship to relationship. And they keep eating the same thing with different muscles. Y'all will get that later. Got a new face, but it's the same place. And you continue to eat the same thing over and over. You keep running from church to church to church to church to church. Sat down somewhere. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. I don't know what we got up in here today. Let me pray for this side. Help them in the name of Jesus. Nothing more disturbing than watching sheep. Some of you wandered up in here because you were hungry. You were looking for something to feel you on the inside. So then I got to give you this solution because most of us, we're trying to find something that will fill a void. We're just not happy. I'm not happy with my life. I'm not happy with my wife. I'm not happy with my job. I'm not happy with my kids. I'm just not happy. Frustrated and you making everybody around you unhappy. Can't nobody even stand to be in your presence because you're so unhappy. People see you coming and say, oh, Lord, Jesus. Not this. Y'all fill in the blank. Hungry sheep make foolish choices. Hungry sheep do stupid stuff. Hungry sheep make foolish choices and don't even realize the danger that they put themselves in because they're wandering aimlessly, uncovered, with no protection, with no shield. And they put themselves in harm's way, not even realizing that that's what they're doing. They keep looking for something. Something's going to give me joy. Something's going to get, if I get more money, then I'll be all right. Then you get more money and you ain't all right. If I get in a good relationship, then I'll be all right. You got in a good relationship, but he wasn't handsome enough. Took care of all of your, your needs and made sure everything was good, but the grass still looked greener. Oh, I'm preaching if you don't say amen. Excuse me one second. Preach, boy. Doing the best I can with what my mama gave me. Matthew 18 and 12 says this, when one sheep is lost, the shepherd will leave the 99 and go after the one. So what happens with the 99? They're uncovered. Isaiah 53 and 6 says this. All we like sheep have gone astray. Tell them, tell people around you, yes, he's talking about you today. No, no, say it with a little too. Put a little stank on it. Are he talking about you today? Smell them, sniff them and see if they smell like sheep. We got some wolves in sheep's clothing. When they wander off, they're looking for food. 
Whenever you're wandering aimlessly and going about life and you keep trying to find something to fill voids, it's because you're hungry. You're looking for something that will sustain you, that will fulfill you. You're looking for spiritual sustenance. You're looking for spiritual food. But here's the thing. You've been looking for it in all the wrong places. Can I, can I just talk to you like I feel like it today? He can't feel you. She can't feel you. And it won't fulfill you. Are y'all with me? Y'all, y'all get me real, y'all get me real riled up when y'all start talking that foolish lie. Oh, he completes me. Then you ain't really made of much. We got company today. Y'all got guests today. Y'all got to tell me up front. You'll know how I get down. And the Lord says, help me, Jesus. Looking for food in all the wrong places. You're trying to be filled with the wrong stuff. Here's the thing. The secret of spiritual satisfaction is to feed people the word of God. The diet that you need, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What? Because I have the word of God. The Bible says that the word of God is more necessary than even your daily food. I shall not want just doesn't mean that he's going to give you temporal sustenance, but he's going to give you something that is eternal and long lasting. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Are y'all with me? You skip on over to John 1 and 14. He says that he is the word. Jesus is the word made flesh and he dwelt among them. So if he is the word of God, then what we need is access to the Savior. Because this is what he says about the Savior. John 6 and 35 says that I am the bread of life and he that eats of this bread will never go hungry. So the problem is not the job your money, the relationship, and all of the other stuff that you've been seeking after. The problem is you don't have the right bread. The bread that will never allow you to go hungry. What you need is the word. That's what you mean to tell me that all I need is to get in this book. That's all I've been trying to tell you for the last 10 years. That if you spend as much energy and time in this book as you do with the housewives, your life would be so much better. You need the word. People ask me all the time, how did you accomplish all that you've accomplished? Y'all bought this and you're buying that and you're doing this and you've done that. How did you do all that you've done at Victory in these 10 years? That's such a short period of time. I know churches that are 100 years old that have not done what you have done. What's your secret? What are you doing? What are you doing to cause the people to keep showing up? And then I have even pastors that will accuse me of being a psalmist on the Sunday morning service. And that's the exclusivity of my presentation people are only showing up over there because he's a singer if I could sing they would show up at my church too well here's the thing what they don't understand is that people that come with a quarter to put it in the jukebox they'll get the song that they want but it won't feed them and keep them in the midnight hour what I need is the word of God you want to know my secret sauce it's the word I preach the word instant in season and out of season I know that it is the unadulterated truth of God and the word kept me from losing my own mind so if it works for me I'm convinced it's gonna work for you too you need the word, 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 the word. You need the word, the word, the word. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm healed by his stripes in the name of Jesus. The word of God. I don't know what you've been looking for, but you've been looking in the wrong place. Listen, the Bible says in Jeremiah 3 and 15, and I will give you pastors according to my own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding in other words i'm going to give you a greater understanding of the word of god so those of those of those people around you that will ask how did you do that how did you get the job how did you make it out how did you get your marriage to work how did you go you need to look at them and say i did it with the word 
did it with the word because heaven knows if I hadn't had the word, I would have killed him a long time ago. If I hadn't had the word, I would have cussed everybody out and walked out so long ago. If it hadn't been for the word, the word keeps me when I don't know how to keep myself. The word encourages me when all my friends walk off and leave me. I remind myself, I got a friend and he sticks closer than any one of my brothers. The word encourages me. Be encouraged in the word. Anybody know that you got power in the word of God? Tell you how powerful the words of God are. God spoke eons ago and he spoke things into existence and all he had to say was let there be. And the same things that he spoke eons ago are still in the same place that he spoke them today. If you look up in the sky, he spoke the sun and the moon and he caused them to be hung in their sockets and the same word that hung them up there in the beginning is the same word that has them hanging there in their place. So if he can do it for the sun and the moon, then surely Surely he can speak over me. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am a royal priesthood. I am an heir to the throne. I am from the bloodline of David. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you knew what God said about you, you would not be worried about what you're looking at because you know he spoke the word. Oh, bless his name. Slap somebody a high five and say, the word, the word. The word. Who I got to hurry up? That's just point number one. Lord is my shepherd. I didn't mean to spend that much time on that. And I shall not walk. But I had a moment. You got to have some moments every now and then. You know, moments when everybody around you think you done lost your mind. Moments, you ever been in the car and see somebody over there having a good time by themselves? They'll be bobbing their head and just singing and just, see every now and then I don't even have no music on, but I'll be bobbing my head and I'll be praising God and thanking him because I realized that I wouldn't even have a car to drive in if it had not been that my shepherd loved me enough to provide every need that I had. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Gives me, he guides me along the path of righteousness for his namesake. See, our Father is not only a God of provision, but he's a God of proper protection, pro position. He makes sure that we are guided and shifted and moved and directed and redirected in the proper position for his blessings. Sometimes because of our own hunger, we wander outside of the wheel. And when you wander outside the wheel, you wander outside the capacity for him to bless you the way that he wants to bless you. So thanks be to God that he loves you enough not to leave you out there lost but that he will reach out and get you and redirect you to the place that you need to be. There are times when we are one move away from our next level of blessings. There are times when we are one decision, one attitudinal shift away from God doing the miraculous in our lives. But because we are all like sheep, we go astray. Sometimes we need a push in the right direction. Sheep have finicky eating needs. They can't eat just from any pasture because certain types of grass don't digest as well as others. And if left to their own vices, sheep will go to an unhealthy pasture and tall grass and they cannot consume it and digest it in the proper way. Some grass that they will graze upon because of the health of the pasture will make the sheep sick because if it's not able to digest accurately then ultimately it will begin to affect their health and their capacity to function and to move there are some things in our lives that we continue to consume because of our own hunger 
and our own desire for fulfillment. But you don't realize it and you've been trying to figure it out. What is it that's making you sick? Well, it's only because you are in the wrong pasture. Oh, help me, Jesus. Can I just preach it like I feel it? Let me help some of y'all out. You've been trying to figure out why there's an emptiness in your life. The emptiness doesn't have anything to do sometimes with your external stimuli, but it has everything to do with your location. Because when you're grazing outside of the will of God, then everything you consume will start to make you sick. You got all the things that you thought you ever wanted. But if you wanted it and you got it, but it wasn't in God's will, then it will begin to spiritually make you sick. And as a result, you become unhealthy and unfit to carry out your mission and your purpose in this life. Let me just give you a real time, a real time uh, a, a description of what that looks like. Because some of y'all are still a little perplexed. The spiritual realm might be over your head. So let me bring it down here to your earthly plane. You know you got high blood pressure. But as soon as you sit down at the table, first thing you reach for. I ain't got to tell y'all nothing. You don't need all that. Yeah, but it tastes better. Yeah, but you're sick. Spiritually, it works in the same way. Yeah, but it feels good. Yeah, but you're sick. Yeah, but it makes sense according to what other people are doing. Yeah, but you're sick. Yeah, it looks good on TV and, 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 and popular culture has embraced it. Yeah, but you're sick. I mean, everybody, everybody tries out the milk before they buy the cow. Yeah, but. Mm. Yeah, if you can't say amen, just say ouch. I know you're sitting next to him right now, so you don't want to look. Another thing that they'll do is when they're hungry, they'll wander off into tall grass. Why is tall grass? He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He lead them beside the still waters. There's purpose for all things that God spoke, has spoken and that he speaks to our lives. There's a reason that he leads you to green pasture. Green pasture is not the tall grasses of the prairie field that grow up. Here's the problem with tall grass. Tall grass, number one, won't allow them to have the proper posture. Proper posture, it, 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 will, it will prevent them from ingesting and digesting adequately. So they're, they're forced to, to stand in a, an improper posture for them to properly digest and for their bodies to, to complete the process of digesting their food. The other problem with tall grass is tall grass hides them in the meadow. So they're now out of the sight of the shepherd who is protecting them from their predator. So it hides them from the sight line. But then another problem with tall grass is that when in the sheep, they produce a natural oil in their skin called lanolin. And the lanolin will coat the, the, the wool of the sheep. And it coats the wool so that the sheep will be able to withstand the high temp temperatures and or the, the vast variations of temperatures on either end of the spectrum. It makes them warmer and it makes them cooler depending on what season it is. So the oil in the skin after coating the wool causes the wool to be just like Velcro. Everything that the sheep touch up against and brush up on, it collects all of the things that are in the environment. Are y'all with me? So the oil on the skin coats the wool. The wool becomes sticky like Velcro. And everything that it brushes up against in the tall grass, that's debris, that's dirt, that's stubble, and even parasites will get attached and find their way through the wool and burrow down to the skin and literally begin to suck the life out of the sheep. So I say that to help us understand that the oil on your life, the anointing that God has on you, 
the special favor and the hand of approval that he has on your life causes your external persona to be sticky. So you can't go everywhere and you can't come in contact with everybody and you can't be around everything because the dirt, the debris, the stubble, and even some parasites will latch on to you and you think that they really like you, but what they really like is the oil that's coming out of your skin. Oh, I feel good about God right here. See, what you understand is that your mama wasn't trying to keep you from going just because she would, didn't like you and didn't want you to have a good time. But she saw something on you that, that she could not allow the enemy to latch on to. It wasn't that she just didn't like your friend. She just knew that your friend was going to contaminate the anointing and the favor that God had on your life. But mama, everybody's doing it. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to do it. There is something special on you that you have not even realized about yourself and I can't let it be contaminated by being in every environment Ooh, bless your name oh God sit down somewhere be careful who you come in contact with because the stuff you touch will attach itself to you people always want to pimp you for your juice come on here somebody People want to get close to you, not because of what they want to give you, but what they can get out of you. Tall grass. That's why the shepherd leads you into green pastures, because tall grass has some weeds. And weeds choke the life out of everything that it tangles itself up in. Tall grass prohibits the sheep from breathing. They become suffocated by their own circumstance. Because the bugs and the parasites leach on to the tall grass. Because of the posture of their nostril while they're trying to graze on tall grass. The bugs will invade their nostrils. And ultimately there will be so many of them compacted into their nostrils that it makes them difficult to breathe. And they can't sleep. And they can't eat. And they can't function. Because the things now have invaded their nostrils. And they can't breathe. The shepherd will come and he will remove the parasites and the bugs and the insects from their nostrils so that they can breathe freely. Some of you can't breathe because you've been suffocated by so much. And the only reason the things have been able to invade your nostrils is because you've been grazing in the wrong pasture. You're going to have to get out the tall grass. Tall grass looks good because it's tall. But everything that looks good, come on somebody. Oh, I know I ain't the only one that heard that growing up. Son, everything that looks good ain't good for you. Everything that glitters, y'all got the same mom and daddy I do, I see. Yea, though I walk, I will fear for thy rod they comfort me. He's not only a God, proper position. He's not only a God of provision, but he's a God of protection. He's a God that knows how to keep me from hurt, harm, and danger. Understand that everybody needs this divine protection. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Please understand that you will have some dark days. Darkness is a part of the process. So I don't care how saved you are, how, how Holy Ghost filled you are. I don't care what pew you sit on in church. I don't care how long you've been in church, you're going to have some dark days. See, the problem is when believers think that because they're a believer, they ain't going to have no more dark days. Darkness never disappears. God didn't take the darkness off the earth. Darkness is with you. Here's the thing. If you look around this room, under your chair is darkness. In certain spots where the light is not focused, there's darkness. Under tables, is darkness. Everywhere you look, you can find darkness. But here's the thing. Whenever he is the good shepherd and he leads us in the righteous path, a path of righteousness for his namesake. Whenever he leads us, he's leading us into light. 
So what happens at the introduction of light is not the dispelling or, or the dispensation of darkness altogether. What happens at the introduction of light is that darkness is put in its place. So it cannot come out from under the chair as long as the light is present. Are y'all with me? So here's the reality. Because we know that darkness is inevitable and it's waiting for the opportunity to engulf us. It is imperative that you have a shepherd who is able, capable, and willing to defend you or protect you. I fear no evil. Here's the thing. I don't fear not evil because of my own fighting ability. But I fear not evil because of who's with me. I got a God that is right or die. When I get in the heat of the battle, he ain't going to turn around and I ain't got to wonder if he's still with me. But I got a God that'll get in the middle of the furnace with me. If y'all don't believe me, ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I got a God that'll step in the lion's den and tango with the lion until he gives the lion lockjaw. I got a God that's with me. I got some family members that ain't with me like my God is with me. Come on, here's somebody. Here's the reality. I'm not afraid. I don't fear the evil that is there lurking for me because God is with me. Because God is a protector. God protects me, first of all, from myself. Yeah, some of you don't understand that yourself is your worst enemy. Yourself is what's causing you to overeat. Come on, somebody. Yourself is what's causing you to hunger for things that are not good for your sustenance and for your life. Sometimes I'm my own worst enemy. See, it says he maketh me lie down in green pastures. Watch this, but he leaves me beside the what? Still waters or quiet waters, depending on what your translation says. But he leads me beside the quiet waters. On the end of a shepherd's staff is a crook. The crook is used so that when the sheep get out of line and they start wandering away, they reach out and they gently guide them back into the herd so that they can continue on the right path. See, sheep, when they get to the water's edge, Sheep will drink of the water and it's necessary for their sustaining life. But here's the thing. Sheep have a problem with water that's flowing. When they come to the edge of water and if the water or the river has a flow to it, it confuses the sheep. They become agitated and unnerved. They don't know how to function. And the tendency of the sheep is that because the water keeps moving, and their brains don't process that I can still drink even though it's moving. The sheep will have a tendency and an inclination to jump in the water. But here's the problem about sheep jumping in water. Has anybody ever had a washcloth? When you hold it, before it's wet, it's light as a feather. But the moment you wet the washcloth, what happens to it? The density grows and it gets heavy. If you drop it in the water, because of the density increasing, it's going to fall or sink to the bottom. Well, the same thing happens with the sheep because the sheep has wool or fleece all around it. So the moment it jumps into the water, its fleece becomes wet and heavy and it will drown because it will sink it to the bottom. So in order to make sure that the sheep has what it needs, the shepherd will grab it and pull it away from the running water and say, if you jump in there, you're going to die. So let me pull you back over here so that you can show up at Sunday morning service on Father's Day and drink from the waters that I've calmed just for you. Let me get you out this relationship and pull you right on over here so that you understand there's a calm water in this area. Thank God that he's a God that protects me from myself. Because with my foolish self, I would have jumped in the water a long time ago and found myself encompassed and drowned almost to death. Come on here, somebody. Watch this. He not only protects me from myself, but he protects me from my enemies. Sheep don't fight. When was the last time you heard of a sheep turning around and attacking the shepherd? How did he die? Well, uh, 
It was a sheep attack. <laughs> Never heard of a sheep that went crazy and killed the shepherd. Sheep don't fight. So we need the shepherd to be our defender. And this is how I always know that some of you all are confused. Because sheep don't growl. Let that sit in for a few minutes. Real sheep understand. I ain't no wolf. So I got to have the shepherd to defend me. If I hold my peace and just let the Lord fight my battle. If I stand still, I'll see the salvation of the Lord. The problem with most of us is that we're confused about our identity. You think you're a wolf, but you don't wrap yourself up like a sheep. And you growling, thinking that you're going to defend yourself. But some things are defended better in secret prayer than they are in public confrontation. Quit trying to tell people off and get them together and start telling God about it and allow him to do what he's able to do. You better listen real closely. Just, just, just let your ears hear what's next to you. Do you hear any growling? Sheep don't growl. Sheep understand that I need the shepherd to defend me. I need him to protect me. I need him to watch over me. There's some enemies that I don't even know are my enemy. There's some enemies that are around me that dress like sheep. They look like church people, but they're trying to kill me at the same time. I need the Lord to protect me. And I'm not going to stand here and try to sniff them out. I'm not going to worry myself and stress myself out while they're at home sleep somewhere. And I'm over here trying to figure out how they're going to kill me because I know I got a God who will protect me. Come on here, saints. You got a God who is your protection and he will protect you from your enemy. One of the greatest protections that we have, and I don't want you to miss this, because when the, when, when, the, when the shepherd sees that the sheep are starting to wander, he pulls them back into the herd. Here's why. Because one of your protections is your herd. One of your protections is the group that you are in. Because when sheep get together, they look bigger in the eyes of their enemies than they really are. So your strength is found in your ability to stay with the herd. Some of us, we wander off. We don't see you for months at a time. Help me, Holy Ghost. Until all hell breaks loose. Until sickness hits your household. Until something goes wrong. Until your wife decides she's going to leave you if you don't go to church. The problem is, you can't wait until the enemy attacks you got to stay with the herd because then the enemy won't attack you. That's strength in numbers. The Bible says one will chase a thousand, two will chase ten thousand. Two or three are gathered in my name. God says, I'll be right there in the middle of you. He says, if you ask touching and agreeing on anything, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have what you have said. Your power is in your ability to stay with the herd. Grab him, just, just grab him by the arm and say, I ain't going to let you go. You ain't just coming for Father's Day. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. I felt the Holy Ghost right there. Now prepare us a table in the presence of my enemies. Now, knowing it's my head with oil and what? My cup runneth over. Thou prepare us a table before me and my enemies. Just say this word. Peace. All of us are seeking it. All of us desire it. All of us need it. And peace is provided because our shepherd is also a God that provides our peace. See, understand that when the shepherd is out in the open field, the wolves, when they start circling, will try to find the highest vantage point. So what the shepherd does is grab the sheep, start redirecting them, into a green, the greenest pasture that is in the area that, that they're in. He pulls them in the green pasture because he has discerned that the wolves are now on the scene. When the wolves are on the scene, his discernment comes because the sheep get agitated. And when they get agitated, they don't know which way to go, what to do, how to, they start being restless and they stop eating. 
So he pulls them over into greener pasture so that their focus will yet again be on the lush greenness of the vegetation in that particular field. Now the vantage point of the wolf is not on the same level because the wolf will look as a hunter for the highest vantage point so that he can survey and put under surveillance his prey. But the shepherd does something that's absolutely amazing. The shepherd, if the sheep are on his right, he will make sure that he puts his right side on the sheep, but he will turn and put his body in between the wolves and the sheep. So every time the wolf looks at the prey and licks his chops as if he's going to kill one of these prey. The shepherd is standing in between the wolf and the sheep so that it's not the sheep that he can see. But before you look at the sheep, you're going to have to see me. And he stands there with his staff in hand, a symbol of victory and a symbol of strength. And as long as the wolf is pacing, looking at the sheep, the shepherd stands there with authority like he was saying, I wished you would. Try me now and see. But two things happen. When the shepherd jumps in between the vantage point, the sight line of the wolf and the sheep, two things happen. Number one, the sheep calm down. They have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And their focus is no longer on the wolves. Their focus is on the green grass that the shepherd has led them to. So they're now laser focused on the green grass. And they have forgotten that on the other side of the shepherd, there are some wolves that would destroy and kill them. See, here's the problem with us. We're too busy peeping around the shepherd trying to see what the wolves are doing when we should be focused on the green grass that God has led us to and leave the wolves to the shepherd. But the other thing that happens is the wolves, they get agitated and frustrated because they want it. They see it. They're pacing for it. But every turn that they have, something continues to register within their, their minds. I can't get to them because the shepherd will take us out of here. So there's nothing I can do. I wish, oh, that's a good lamb chop right there. Oh, I would have that one right there. That's a fat one. Oh, that would be a good one. But every time they think about making a move, they have to rethink it until eventually something amazing happens. They finally resolve in themselves. Well, we've stood here licking our lips long enough and ain't nothing we're going to be able to do to get past the shepherd. So we give up and we're going to go on and try to find another herd. See, what, the, what they have figured out that some of you haven't even figured out is that the enemy is already defeat it if you would focus on what you're eating if you would get in the word of God and focus on the green pasture your enemy has already been mentally defeated oh help me Holy Ghost just keep eating I lost my job just keep eating. My friends are lying on me behind my back. They're stabbing me. Just keep eating. Stop worrying about what the wolves are saying in the barbershop and the beauty shop. Just keep see peace. Watch this. I love this. Thank you Holy Ghost. Let me give you this and I got to get out of this. Sometimes God doesn't remove the enemy. Sometimes he makes the enemy stand on the sideline 
and watch you eat everything God has provided for you. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemy. He anointed my head with oil and my cup runneth over. The devil can't stand that you are so blessed and there's nothing he can do about it. This show is good. This show is good. I don't know how you got the job. This show is good. I don't know how you can afford the house. I know your credit was toe up from the flow up. Oh, this show is good. I don't think you like me anyway. I don't like you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I don't like you. I just don't like you. But this show is good. Because ain't nothing you're going to be able to do to stop me. Everything God has for me, it is for me. Everything that he promised and prepared for me, your hating ain't going to take it. Your depression ain't going to take it. Your blocking ain't going to take it. If God says it's mine, it sure is good. Slap somebody and say, it sure is good. Yeah, that's real country. I'm trying to teach y'all how to be country. You city slickers. It sure is good. What, what does that mean? It sure is delicious. Show sure is good. Anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, surely, surely. See, God is not a God of just protection, but he's also a God of promises. And every promise that he makes, he keeps it. Surely. Somebody say surely. That means not maybe, not if, not perhaps, not it might. Surely. That means it's certain, it's absolute, it's in, 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 inevitable. That means it's going to happen beyond a shadow of a doubt. It will be what God has said it will be. Surely. That means you can't take it, twist it. They can't fire me from it. They can't snatch it from it. They can't repossess it out of me. Surely. It's going to happen just like God says it's going to happen. Surely. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. You mean when I wander off, when I go astray, when I find myself in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people in the wrong conversation, the wrong crowd, that I can turn around and goodness and mercy going to be standing right there to rescue me. See, here's why. If you look at the literal definition, goodness, you can actually translate this scriptural text to say grace and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here's why I got excited. Because grace is that God gave me what I didn't deserve. Everything that I should not have had, through grace, God blessed me with it. But then on the other side, mercy is that God didn't give me the punishment that I should have received. Are y'all with me? So when I got excited, I got excited because you mean to tell me that everywhere I have been, grace has been providing for me. Some of y'all rode in on grace. Some of you got on the bus this week on grace. Some of you got food on your table because of his grace. You got a roof over your head because of God's grace. I used to wonder why my grandmama would shout every time I started singing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I could count on it every single time. My grandmama was going to jump up and say, thank God. And I wonder why you keep shouting on that song in my church. It's because she realized everything God has done. He did it because of his grace. I couldn't afford it. I wasn't righteous enough for it. I didn't deserve it. I couldn't earn it. But he loved me so much that by his grace, I'm still alive. But then I got even more excited because I looked on the other side and the Wonder Twins were working together. Here comes grace, but right beside them is mercy. You should have been. You could have been. Oh, you better think about the dark corners you've been in in your life. You could have been. You should have been. You would have been. But God's mercy says, oh no, you can't destroy this one. They shall have everlasting. Hey, bless your I 
thank him for his grace grace and mercy grace and mercy grace his I got to get out of here y'all listen this is why I got excited because I started doing some discovery and I found out that it wasn't just grace by itself it was it was the wonder twins grace and mercy mercy and here's why here's why both of them were necessary because when you add God's mercy to God's grace it equals God's favor so you mean to tell me that everywhere I have been in my life the favor of God has been creeping up behind me trying to arrest me and give me the desires of my heart favor opened doors that I know folks slammed in my face favor brought me in when everybody pulled me out favor made me qualified when I did not have the qualification favor favor I got it favor thank God for his favor thank God for his favor thank God for his favor favor will get you in favor will get you through favor will get you on surely 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 You got it. You didn't even know you had it. You got it. It's already done. It's already yours. Your name is already on it. Favor said yes. When they said no, it's yours, it's yours. It's yours, it's yours. grace who pushed me that was mercy I would have given up a long time ago but grace and mercy mercy and grace favor and praise God for his grace and thank God for his mercy He could have left you on the corner. He could have left you by yourself. But God's grace. But God's mercy. But God's grace. But God's mercy. Every time I turn around. But God's grace.
darkness and all You can be quiet if you wanna, but you wasn't there when he saved my soul. I know what the Lord. Hey! The bullet went by the head. It didn't hit you in the head. You walked out of the hospital. You did not in the hospital. God brought you out. God kept you. God raised you. God lifted you. God covered you. God shielded you. God protected you. God elevated you. Somebody give God glory.
I got a feeling everything gonna be all right. I got a feeling everything. God, I thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for life-giving, life-changing, liberating word that lets us know we are free indeed. That we're free from the hand of the enemy that would sift us like wheat, destroy us, kill us, steal us, and destroy us. And everything connected to us. We bind him now in the name of Jesus Christ. We speak to sickness that it has to release your children. Because you promise surely goodness and mercy are following us the favor of God is upon us for that God we're grateful thank you for reminding us that we've got a good father a great shepherd a heavenly father that watches over us through the dangers that we can see and that we don't see thank you for bringing it back to our remembrance that everything is going to be alright I am encouraged. I am encouraged to know, God, that your word is true. Every promise that you've spoken to me, it shall be as you have spoken it. I thank you, Lord, that in spite of myself, grace and mercy still look after me. That even in my own foolish faults, when I wander aimlessly outside of your will, that you protect me, you shield me, you cover me, and that you still love me. Thank you, God. Thank you that you've given me the promise of eternity. Now, Lord, there may be some man, some woman, some boy, some girl that is under the sound of my voice who's not yet received you, so they don't have the luxury and the benefit of this promise. I ask that you would move on their hearts even now, God, that you would show them the error of their ways, that what they've been searching for, what they've been looking for is found in you. That you, oh God, the word made flesh are the way, the truth, and the life, and that they will never see the abundance of eternity, the abundant life even on this plane, the peace that you promised until they receive you in their hearts. Move in this place right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Move, oh God, like never before. Move on every person under the sound of my voice across the globe right now that you would remind them that you still have them covered, that you're still their shepherd if they simply receive you. Romans 10, 9 and 10, you said if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts uh, that you were raised from the dead, then we shall be saved. We thank you for salvation today. Thank you for those around the world that will be saved, that will receive your power, that will receive your forgiveness and your love and also receive everlasting life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're about to do. We praise you for it in advance. We say amen. GYA, it means give yourself away. And at Victory, it's more than just a slogan. It's who we are. We're living to be missed, not just remembered. And thanks to your generous support, we're changing the world one heart at a time. Find out more and give now at getthevictory.org slash GYA. We hope you were blessed by today's message. For more information about what's happening in and around Victory, visit us online at SmokeyNorfolk.com. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Be blessed and keep walking in victory.